Hello, everybody. This is John Allen, the editor of Crux, your one-stop shopping destination for the very best in smart, wired, and independent Catholic journalism, and also the host of this show, Last Week in the Church, where we bring you somewhat stale, kind of leftover Catholic news, but we raid the fridge, take it out, sprinkle over some spices on our secret Crux brand sauce, and serve it up piping hot. Here's what we've got for you this week. We begin with Banned in San Fran. Archbishop Salvatore Cordiglione bans publicly House Speaker Nancy Pelosi from communion in the Archdiocese of San Francisco. We'll explain what that means. Then, beautiful day. Pope Francis and Bono of U2 hang out to talk ecology. Then, Battle in Beichu. Italian Cardinal Angelo Beciu, the star defendant in the Vatican's trial of the century, wraps up his testimony. We'll explain what that means. Then, brother, can you paradigm? Pope Francis changes the paradigm for election of superiors and religious congregations. We'll break that down. And then finally, such a lovely place. A Vatican hotel, not the Hotel California, but the Hotel Vaticana, is suddenly up for new ownership, and it turns out that Bill Gates in his Four Seasons franchise might be the new operators. We'll also break down what that means. All that and more is waiting for you on the other side of this brief interlude, so please stick around. <laughs> All right. Well, happy Tuesday to you. Thanks for joining us here on Last Week of the Church. We begin with the story of House Speaker Nancy Pelosi being publicly barred from receiving communion in the Archdiocese of San Francisco by Archbishop Salvatore Cordiglione. Now, in one sense, this is an utterly predictable development and perhaps not particularly consequential. It's predictable in the sense that Cordiglione and Pelosi have been sparring over the reception of communion for a long time. Not long ago, Archbishop Cordiglione endorsed a campaign called Rose and Rosary for Nancy, the effort to send a rose and a rosary to Speaker Pelosi to try to convince her to change her position in support of abortion rights. He has dangled the possibility of barring her from communion for some time now, so this is probably not a particularly surprising development. And in terms of how consequential it is, let us remember that Speaker Pelosi, although she represents the San Francisco area, spends most of her time in Washington, D.C., which ecclesiastically is under the jurisdiction of Cardinal Wilton Gregory, who has signaled in multiple ways that he prefers a more dialogic approach to the dispute between the American government and the bishops over abortion. He's not supportive of communion bans, and so she'll probably be able to continue to receive communion in the Archdiocese of Washington. Further, you know, when Speaker Pelosi travels around the country, unless other bishops adopt similar communion bans, good advance work on the part of Speaker Pelosi's team would probably be able to identify a local pastor who was willing to administer her communion despite the disagreement over abortion. So it may not mean very much in the short term in terms of her ability to, you know, receive the Eucharist when she goes to Mass. However, there are a couple of points worth unpacking about all of this. First is the question of how much support Archbishop Cordiglione's position with Speaker Pelosi would actually command in the National Conference. The latest count is there are at least nine Catholic bishops who publicly, mostly through Twitter, have communicated their support for Archbishop Cordiglione's stance. There may be far more 
who have not yet issued public statements, but who nevertheless would be supportive. You know, best guess is that there are probably about 25% of the American bishops who would support this position. But of course, that would leave, you know, 75% who, you know, would either like agree that maybe Pelosi shouldn't be receiving communion, but they don't want to make a public spectacle out of it, or bishops who would say that actually, you know, her position, while maybe objectionable, is nevertheless reasonable and who would not deny her communion. And what all that indicates is that we have a divided American Bishops' Conference on this question, and that going forward, it is very difficult to say what the majority of American bishops might do. The other thing that is worth noting is that as we are waiting for this looming Supreme Court decision on the Roe v. Wade ruling from 1973, assuming the, the leak draft of the Supreme Court decision is actually upheld. What that is going to do, among other things, is that it's going to shift the battleground over abortion from the federal level to the state level. Because if Roe v. Wade is overturned, then that means that states will have the power to decide how accessible abortion is going to be, which would mean that American bishops who up to this point have largely set out the debate, are going to be compelled to take positions because on a state-by-state -state basis, this battle over abortion rights is going to be fought out. And it will be fascinating to track how many bishops are willing to say that a governor or a state legislator who supports abortion rights and who was also Catholic as a result of that, ought to be denied communion. I don't know how to predict how, how that is going to play out, but I guarantee you it is going to be the drama of the American Catholic Church for some time to come. All right, next, Beautiful Day, which of course is the title of a famous U2 song, probably my favorite U2 number of all time, by the way. I don't know. I mean, I sometimes wonder whether I still don't know what I'm looking I still haven't found what I'm looking for, or that is my favorite U2 song. But in any event, Bono, the lead singer of U2, was in Rome last week to participate in a Vatican event in which he had the opportunity to meet Pope Francis. It was an event sponsored by Scolas Ocurrentes, which is an organization that Pope Francis has sponsored from the very beginning, which brings students. So high school, college students from around the world, especially the Americas, but also other parts of the world together, to try to talk about, you know, I guess, how to build a better world. Pope Francis, by the way, recently elevated Scolas Ocurrentes to the status of an international pontifical movement which means that it is going to be kind of a permanent fixture in the Catholic Church. And this most recent meeting was devoted to the issue of ecology and specifically the Pope's encyclical Laudato Si, the first papal encyclical ever devoted entirely to issues of the environment. And the question was, how do we promote greater ecological consciousness in the Catholic community. Now, Bono was on hand. I mean, honestly, I don't really know why, but he was there. I say I don't really know why, because the truth of it is Bono isn't even Catholic. I mean, he's part of a family from Northern Ireland that is traditionally Protestant. But nevertheless, he is somebody who has been around the Vatican scene a lot. I mean, I actually covered the moment a number of years ago when Bono met Pope John Paul II. And you may remember the famous photograph when Pope John Paul put on Bono's sunglasses. <laughs> and this became a kind of iconic image that went around the world. In any event, Bono was also here this past week. And Bono had the opportunity to ask Pope Francis a question. 
And the question he asked was, what about the role of women in the ecological movement? And Pope Francis responded, well, you know, when we talk about the earth, it's actually much more common to say Mother Earth than Father Earth. And that was taken as a kind of indication that the Pope agrees with Bono that there is a very important role for women, I suppose, especially mothers, in terms of protecting the, the environment and protecting the ecological integrity of the earth. What I remember is this, that in the year 2000, when Bono and then Pope John Paul II agreed about debt relief, for impoverished nations in the great jubilee year 2000. President Clinton, when he signed into law a debt relief act in the United States, said that when the Pope and pop stars are singing from the same hymnal, it tells you which way the stars are aligned. Well, once again, we have the Pope and pop stars singing from the same hymnal we will see if it has the same social and political impact. All right, third story up on the docket this week. Battle in Beichu. Italian Cardinal Angelo Beichu, who was, is the former sort of papal chief of staff, he used to be the sustituto, meaning the substitute, in the Secretary of State, who was the guy who basically runs the internal Catholic show, on, or at least the internal Vatican show, uh, on behalf of the Pope. He is now the superstar defendant in the Vatican's trial of the century, which is this trial that centers on a $400 million real estate deal in London to buy a property in Chelsea, which went horribly wrong, but there are also other charges against Beichu involving diverting money from the Vatican Secretary of State to his home diocese in Sardinia, Ozieri, and also involving his relationship with a woman, Cecilia Maronia, who I don't quite even know what to say. She was like a 007 security consultant for the Vatican on various things. So anyway, Beichu has been tes testifying in front of this Vatican trial. He's now had three hearings. And this last week, he wrapped up his third and presumably, although we don't know for sure, but presumably his final bout of testimony in front of the Vatican Tribunal, this three-judge tribunal that is hearing the case. And there are several items of interest. One has to do with the Italian Bishops' Conference, CE, which is the Episcopal Conferenza Italiana. The, the acronym is CEI, which we here in Italy call CE. Now, CE sent some money to Beichu's home diocese in Sardinia called Ozieri. This is actually not one of the charges against Beichu in the trial, but it nevertheless has come up in questioning from prosecutors. Beichu basically said during this most recent round of testimony that he felt that was an, ins uh, an insult to his character and to his dignity as a priest, and he basically refused to testify. You know, we'll see where that goes. Another interesting element from Beichu's most recent testimony had to do with the Vatican's former auditor general, a guy by the name of Libero Milone, who was hired in 2014 to be the Vatican's own internal independent auditor. He was fired, I, you know, basically a year into his tenure. A lot of people at the time thought that Beichu was trying to get rid of him because Maloney was coming uncomfortably close to exposing some financial shenanigans in the Vatican. Now, when Beichu was initially asked about that. He refused to answer, saying it was covered by the pontifical secret. But this last week, 
Beichu said he had gone to Pope Francis personally and asked him if he could have permission to tell the truth about the Maloney firing, and Pope Francis had given him that permission. So what Beichu said this past week is that he had absolutely nothing to do with firing Maloney, that in fact what had happened is that Pope Francis had called him up when he was still the sostituto and said, I want you to tell Maloney that he has been fired. And so Beichu said he dutifully called up Maloney, brought him in, said, you're out, because that's what the Pope told him to do. And the reason, Beichu said, is the same reason that was given in a subsequent Vatican statement, which was that Maloney had, well, basically <laughs> hired a security company to wiretap various Vatican officials, which the theory went, exceeded his authority, and that's why the Pope wanted him out. Anyway, Beichu's basic point was, all I did was what the Pope told me to do. I had no other involvement than that. Beichu also discussed during his testimony a, a potential Vatican investment that never happened. It involved the nation of Angola, where Beichu had once been the papal ambassador, where a businessman, <laughs> I'm not making this up, okay? I know this sounds like something that a Hollywood screenwriter would come up with, but a businessman by the name of Antonio Mosquito, Mosquito, wanted to take a bite out of the Vatican by getting them to invest in a kind of oil deal in Angola. Beichu testified that he had in, he'd brought this guy into the Vatican. He had introduced him to, you know, the financial decision makers in the Vatican. They looked at this possible oil deal in Angola for about a year and a half, eventually decided that they didn't have the necessary guarantees of income and bailed, which is what then drove them to make this investment in property in London. Now, another thing that is interesting is that Beichu said that the reason we were looking for investments is because the Secretary of State was running a huge deficit because it had to cover the expenses of Vatican Radio and it also had to cover the expenses of Vatican embassies around the world and they just didn't have the money. And so they were looking to find it various places. That's why they were interested in the deal in Angola and eventually that's why they made the deal in London. Finally, and I think probably the most interesting thing about Beichu's testimony this week, is that he talked about this, this woman, Cecilia Maronia, who bills herself as a kind of humanitarian 007, a humanitarian who's interested in international security issues and his relationship with her. Beichu testified that Maronia was introduced into the Vatican in order to help secure the release of a Colombian nun, that is a nun from Colombia, who was serving in the African nation of Mali, who had been kidnapped by jihadists in 2017, and who was finally liberated in 2021 apparently as the result of a Vatican payoff. Basically, they ransomed her. But Maronia also deposited in the Vatican a 20-page, whatever, testimony, right, in which she tried to explain her relationship with various Vatican officials. And among other things, Here's something she said that was very interesting. She said that one of her roles was to introduce a couple of Russians to Beichu. Now, these Russians initially, apparently, felt that there was an account in the Vatican Bank code-labeled Imperial, 
which belong, and, and by the way, these Russians purported to be emissaries of President Vladimir Putin. They claim that this account in the Vatican Bank actually belonged to Russia. Beichu apparently looked into this, could find no such account, that kind of drop. But these emissaries also then apparently asked for the return of the relics of San Nicolo, who was a saint much revered in Russian Orthodox tradition. Those uh, remains are currently in Bari in Italy. They were loaned to Russia briefly, but remain under the ownership of Bari. Apparently, these emissaries wanted the relics to be returned to Russian ownership. Beichu was involved in the meeting, according to Moronia, but apparently said, well, look, this is, the, uh, this is up to the Archdiocese of Bari. These guys apparently said, well, we're, we'll get a letter from Patriarch Kirill, who was the head of the Russian Orthodox Church, re requesting their return. The letter never materialized, which led to some questions about whether these guys actually had the kind of status that they were claiming to have. The, the point here is, like, it is kind of unimaginable the, the different pressures and the different situations that a sustituto, that is, the papal chief of staff, actually has to face. What does all this testimony in the trial tell us? Well, what it tells us is that Beichu is claiming that he was acting on the advice of Vatican financial advisors, that this was never his personal judgment, that he was simply doing what he had been advised to do by the people the Vatican pays to make financial decisions, and that therefore he is innocent of any crime. Whether the Vatican court is actually going to buy that as time goes by, we don't know. All right, brother, can you paradigm? You know the, the famous American folk song, Brother, Can You Spare a Dime? Well, there was kind of an analog to that in the Vatican this week because Pope Francis issued a rescript, which is a kind of legal decree indicating that religious orders from now on have the authority, the permission, one could say, of Rome to elect non-clerics, that is, brothers who are not priests, to be their superiors should they so choose. Now, the rescript says they still need the, what, the permission of the Vatican's Congregation for Religious, technically the Congregation for, what is it, the Societies of Apostolic Life and the Institutes of Religious Life, something like that. Anyway, what we all call the Congregation for Religious. They still need their permission, but the idea is that permission should be granted, okay? Now, this is a bit of a sea change because in the past, the Vatican has been very reluctant to allow religious orders to elect non-clerics as their superiors. Good example, in 2009, the Marian Royal Fathers in the United States elected a brother who was not a priest as their superior. The Vatican refused permission for it. A few years earlier than that, the Capuchins in the United States had elected a brother as the superior of one of their provinces. The Vatican refused permission for that as well. Now, this was not entirely consistent because there was another religious order in Kenya that had elected a brother as their superior, and the Vatican did grant permission. But in any event, there was always this theory that the power of governance in the Catholic Church should belong almost exclusively to clerics. Now, Pope Francis without ever announcing in any, you know, major public way this is what he is doing, has been gradually unraveling that idea that only clerics should hold the power of governance. You may remember that a few months ago, the Pope issued a new decree saying that lay people could actually be the heads of Vatican dicasteries. Now, he has said, 
that canonically would amount to lay people. Because a brother, even though you and I might not think of him as a lay person, canonically that's what he is. Because under canon law, you're either fish or fowl. You're either ordained if, or you're not. And if you're not ordained, you're a lay person. Okay? And now the Pope has said that a lay person can be the superior of a religious order. This, in effect, resolves what has been a long standing debate about whether the power of governance in the Catholic Church can actually be exercised by lay people. One theory has always been the power of governance depends upon apostolic succession. That is, that Christ gave power in the church to the apostles, and the apostles named bishops after them, and those bishops designated other clerics to exercise authority in their names, and that therefore it was all tied up with the clerical state. Another theory has always been the power in the church isn't necessarily invested in clerics. It can be exercised by other people. And Pope Francis, again, without ever holding a press conference and saying, this is what I am doing, in a series of decisions has effectively settled that debate in favor of the idea that lay people, as well as clerics, can exercise the power of governance, both in the Vatican and now also in religious orders around the world. Whatever you make of it, that's a very important transition, and it is worthy of note. Okay, finally this week, it's a beautiful, it's a lovely place. That is a line, of course, from the famous song Hotel California. But in this case, we're not talking about a hotel in California. We're talking about a hotel in Rome. Specifically, we're talking about the former Hotel Columbus, which, if you've ever been to Rome, you know it is right in the middle of the Via della Conciliazione. That's that broad avenue that leads up to St. Peter's Square. It is, I mean, I don't know exactly, but it's, I can tell you, it's less than a five-minute walk from there to St. Peter's Square, into the Vatican. Now, that property some time ago was given to the Knights and Dames, the Order of the Holy Sepulchre, which is an order founded to support the church in the Holy Land. So, that is, in Israel, Palestine, Jordan, you know, what is considered the birthplace of Christianity. And the idea was, that owning this property, the Order of the Holy Sepulchre, could devote all of their income directly to supporting the church in the Holy Land because their administrative costs would be covered by whatever they earn from this property. So for a long time, they ran a hotel called the Hotel Columbus. However, just before the COVID pandemic really broke out, this hotel shut down, and it's been closed ever since. So, the Order of the Holy Sepulchre has been looking for a new, what? A new occupant, right? Somebody else to run the property. And not so long ago, they put out a tender, so an invitation for bids, for various people who might want to run this hotel a stone's throw away. Literally. A st I mean, seriously, you can stand in front of the Hotel Columbus, and even I, Okay, and I'm no athlete. I could stand in front of the Hotel Columbus and throw a rock that would land in St. Peter's Square. That's how close it is, okay? So they were inviting people to bid on this property, and, and various people did. They got about 60 offers. One of those finalists was the Four Seasons Hotel franchise, the majority owner of which now is Bill Gates, right, of Microsoft fame. And they want to turn this into a kind of five-star luxury property. Now, this has raised questions on a couple of fronts. One is, in the Pope Francis era, where the Vatican is, you know, taking care of homeless people, who, by the way, sometimes sleep on benches right in front of this hotel property, and trying to take care of refugees, and so on, you know, should the Vatican really be welcoming in a five-star hotel chain? 
you know, another is from some of the people who lost out in the bidding process who were asking, well, wait a minute. I mean, we were told that this wasn't supposed to be excessively luxurious. Now, like, we lost to this outfit that is just known for being wildly luxurious. Is that really fair? Some of them are actually talking about filing a class action lawsuit. You know, we don't know where all this is going to end up. But it is very interesting. Like, if we end up with a situation where the Four Seasons is actually running a hotel right above a space in which the Vatican is providing free lodging and, you know, hygienic care to the homeless and to refugees and so on, can you imagine a more perfect embodiment of the great ironies of the Catholic Church? You know, as Walt Whitman Verrett once famously said, I contradict myself very well then. I contradict myself. I am vast. I contain multitudes. Well, the Catholic Church is vast too, and it contains multitudes, and this property may soon be a perfect sort of symbolic representation of all of that. All right, that is our show for this week. You can find full coverage of all these stories on the Crux site. Again, that is cruxnow.com, cruxnow.com, your one-stop shopping destination for the very best in smart, wired, and independent Catholic commentary. While you're there, you can also find a handy-dandy way to make a financial contribution to Crux. If you could, we would be deeply grateful. Our independence is our greatest asset, but it isn't free. We need your support to make sure that we can still maintain that important critical distance from officialdom in order to bring you the news without spin and without varnish. In the meantime, my charge to you over the next week is stay safe, stay healthy, have a fantastic and blessed week, and we will talk to you again soon.